conceived in the 1820s and completed to Newark by 1831, the Morris Canal greatly improved on the inefficient use of horse and wagon to carry goods on poorly maintained roads and over long distances. By 1845, the canal traveled 109 miles from the Delaware River in the west to Newark and then on to Jersey City in the east. From Phillipsburg, it climbed the mountains of northern New Jersey, step by step, from one level to another until it reached its summit near Lake Apatcon. From there it descended to tide level at Newark. Locks and incline planes were used to overcome the changes in elevation. For elevation changes less than 20 feet, locks were used. To overcome greater changes, incline planes were used. Plane 9 West, located four and one half miles from the Delaware River at Port Warren, was the longest and highest plane on the Morris Canal. The following animation shows how the engineering marvel that was Plane 9 West functioned in the 19th century. Engineers Ephraim Beach and James Renwick introduced the incline plane system to the Morris Canal. Without this engineering marvel, the Morris Canal would not have been possible. Twenty locks in two flights of ten would have been required at Plane 9 West alone. So how did it actually work? Water from the upper level of the canal entered a wooden flume. When a valve is raised, water flows down a tube called a penstock. With enormous pressure, it escapes through the forearms of a scotch turbine, causing the turbine to rotate and drive a series of gears. The gears engage with a large cable winding drum. When the drum rotates, cables are fed out and drawn in. The cable drum rotates in the same direction as the bevel gear with which the clutch is engaged. To change the drum's rotation, the turbine must be stationary. The clutch is then moved over to engage with the opposite bevel gear. The particular cable configuration of Plane 9 West allowed for simultaneous two-way traffic. It was not unusual for 30 boats to use the plane per day. In the 1860s, during the Civil War, the number might have been as high as 50. Losing business to the expanding railroads slowed canal activity down so that by the end of the 19th century, the end was in sight. In the early 1920s, the state of New Jersey took control of the canal system. It retained a handful of lakes for public use and partitioned, dismantled, and sold off the remaining properties. It was the end for Plane 9 West. Well, not exactly. In 1946, James and Mary Lee purchased Plane 9 West. He purchased the plane tender's house from a Raymond Smith, who had obtained it in 1929 from the state of New Jersey. I was already on the scene but my parents wasted no time and gave birth to my twin brothers and another brother in one short year. When my sister came along, the regiment was complete. My maternal grandmother, red-headed Lizzie, had worked as a mule driver for her father's boat when she was young. She was able to direct my father as to where to begin the excavation of the plain. By then it was covered by earth and grass. My father enjoyed watching his sons grow. The four of us were recruited and worked off and on at the excavation for years. We hauled rubble and rocks from the shaft of the penstock. Here we are in our teens. This is my brother Bill and myself in our 20s. This is me more recently. We invited curious friends and neighbors to assuage their suspicions that nothing sinister had been going on with all the years of digging. Here we are, James Lee Sr., James Lee Jr., and James Lee III proudly displaying the surviving turbine. 
And here we have the restored and modernized Plain Tender's house with adjoining museum. The early tenants of the 1800s may have wondered what would become of it, just as we wonder what life was like on the plain in those days. Thanks to the Canal Society of New Jersey, government agencies, and passionate individuals like James Lee, thousands of artifacts, photographs, and portions of the historic waterway have been preserved, and through them we can better imagine how it actually was. To further protect and preserve this valuable historic asset, Warren County purchased Plain 9 West and put it into public ownership. Investing in its maintenance and preservation for everyone to enjoy and get a true sense of this magnificent engineering marvel. Now Plain 9 West is yours to explore. The Old Canal, a poem by James Lee Sr. The Morris Canal is long since gone, but yet it's on my mind. The faithful mules that work so hard have all been left behind. There's the sound of the boatman's horn echoing from the hill. I know there is no boat around, but I can hear it still. No note is sweeter to my soul than that blown on the shell. If you could hear it just one time, you'd know of what I tell. So when you pass the ruins of a canal, no matter where, perpetuate their memory and say a silent prayer. As a cradle car at the top of Plain 9 West is pulled toward the upper level of the canal, another car, loaded with a westbound boat, is descending to the lower level of the canal at Port Warren. The empty car enters the water and is positioned at the head of the plain, ready to transport the next boat headed west down the nearly 100-foot change in elevation. The captain, on the boat heading west, throws the tow line to a waiting mule driver. The mules, once fastened to the tow line, pull the boat out of the cradle car, cross over Lopatcon Creek, and make their way down the towpath toward Plain 10 West and Phillipsburg. They will pass under Mars Canal Bridge No. 6 and pass the boat of Captain Peter Lenstrom, who is tied up to a small landing for Klein's store. Across the canal, Captain Lenstrom's daughter, Lizzie, is tending her father's mules. She is accompanying her father on a trip from Phillipsburg to Hackettstown to deliver coal and sawdust. This imaginary trip takes place about 1908, when the canal was in its waning years. Lizzie and her father will live in the 10 by 10 cabin at the rear of the boat on this and other trips, some as far as Patterson and Newark. This location on the canal was also known as Hardport and was difficult for navigation, possibly due to the current caused by Lopatcon Creek entering the canal at this point. Once their business at Klein's store is completed, Lizzie leads her mules under Mars Canal Bridge No. 6 and over Lopatcon Creek to the waiting cradle car. Once the boat is in the cradle car, Captain Lenstrom fastens the boat to cleats that are provided on the car. He then blows his conch horn, signaling the plane tender that he is ready to be pulled up the plane. 
The plane tender who is stationed in the cupola of the powerhouse hears the conch signal. He releases the brake, which has stopped and positioned the cradle cars at the top and bottom of the plane. He then moves the clutch to the proper position to reverse the travel of the cradle cars so that one car will ascend with the boat and the other car will descend in the opposite direction. Next he raises the plug valve to apply water from the flume to the turbine. A counterweight assists in the raising of the valve. The water required to operate Plane 9 West has made its way to the top of the plane by traveling through inclines, locks, and the canal channel, all by the force of gravity from its main source of Lake Apacom. Water rushes into the penstock, which is wooden above ground and is a 5 foot diameter cast iron tube underground. It comes up underneath the turbine, which is in a vaulted stone chamber with a head of about 47 feet, and exits with great force through the four turbine arms, causing the turbine to spin at about 67 RPM. power from the spinning turbine is transmitted through a shaft to the gearing above ground, where a crown gear drives two bevel gears. The bevel gears, which turn in opposite directions, are connected by a shaft and are selected by a clutch to turn the winding drum in the direction required to raise or lower the cradle cars and boats. The 13-foot diameter winding drum turns in the direction of the bevel gear which is engaged by the clutch. A brake consisting of a metal band fastened around a wheel on the opposite side of the mechanism from the winding drum can be applied by the operator in the cupola. Mechanical advantage is realized by a small gear acting on a large gear on the inside of the winding drum. The winding drum has grooves for the cable to wind on and off smoothly. The cable is fastened to the cradle car in the northern track after passing around an underwater shiv wheel. It is also fastened to the second cradle car in the southern track by way of underwater shiv wheels. The two cradle cars are also connected by a back cable that passes around an underwater shiv wheel at the bottom of the plane. Thus, as the cable winds onto and off of the winding drum, the cradle cars are moved up and down the plane on their respective tracks. The time to ascend or descend Plane 9 West was about 12 minutes, compared to an hour and 40 minutes for a staircase of 10 locks.
the incline plane also use less water. The turbine, which is rotating during the entire boat transporting process, discharges its water into the underground tailrace tunnel. The tailrace emerges from its underground channel, and along with any overflow water, the expended water travels down an open ditch to the lower level of the canal, where it is available to be used at the next incline plane, which is plane 10 west. The two cradle cars pass each other at the halfway point on the plane. In this case, the descending cradle car is empty, but it could have transported a boat down at the same time one was being raised, if one were available. Lizzie will have to hurry with the mules to meet the cradle car and boat at the top of the plane. summit of the plane, it is evident why the car and boat are hinged. A one-section boat and car might have broken the keel when loaded and passing over the summit. As the car and boat enter the upper level of the canal, the plane tender shuts off the flow of water to the turbine by lowering the valve back into the penstock, causing the turbine to stop rotating. Lizzie, who has allowed the mules to eat and rest, now leads them up to meet the boat. The plane tender sets the brake, stopping the cradle cars into positions at the top and bottom of the incline. Lizzie has now arrived at the upper level with the mules and her father, Captain Lenstrom, has thrown the tow line to the towpath for her to fasten to the mules. Lizzie leads the mules, which are now fastened to the boat, up the towpath, pulling the boat out of the cradle car and past a boat waiting to be taken down the plain. They will travel east, about one and a half miles, to Plain 8 West, near Stortsville ascending that plane and other planes and locks on their way to Hackettstown. Peter Lenstrom, my great-grandfather, would continue to work on the Morris Canal for many years, finally participating in its deconstruction in the 1920s. He and his wife, Belle, Nee Van Sickle, would raise eight children while working for the canal company. Frogmouth Patsy and Patty the Rat as well. Jimmy the Mouse, old Patty's son, and Patty's good wife Nell. Remember the poor old Dagon brothers, the Pendies and the Peers. Pigeon Nixon and his gang of Jackie's racketeers. 
must stop my rambling Is she just not a Ford? The famous tiller shark said Roll the water Easton, the Blacks both Bill and Lon Pug nosed Jim with the boxed up chin and Guinea Hollow John Then Big Bill Garden and Harry Siska bubbling Their middle was so very wide they could scarcely squeeze in the cabin Must stop my rambling is she just not a Ford Famous Tiller Shark said roll the water more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hmm.